everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar that East Melbourne PHN is hosting on behalf of Kidney Health Australia. The topic tonight is Make the Link, Chronic Kidney Disease, Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease. My name is Stephanie Lenko and on behalf of East Melbourne PHN, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Make sure you're comfortable with your drink of choice or a nice cup of tea uh, and settle in. Annette and I would like to acknowledge and thank the traditional custodians on whose unceded lands we gathered this evening. I acknowledge that I'm working on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I wish to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the first peoples of Australia. Now for some housekeeping. I've got my old plates on, so in the background, I've got Kathy Tepper, who's going to help me if I have any technical difficulties, fingers crossed. All attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar and the chat function has been disabled. However, questions, we encourage questions. And if you can use the Q&A box, your questions will be answered opportunistically. And then as the presentation, at the end of the presentation, if there's any unanswered questions. The webinar is being recorded, so you can reference it back again, and it will be made available on the Kidney Health Australia website. Hopefully you've had a chance to peruse the case study, which was emailed last evening, and have had a go at answering some of the questions. The case study is uh, going to be referred to throughout tonight's presentation. As an upfront reminder about completing the all important evaluation at the end of the session, which you'll be able to access via a QR code or as a link in the chat, uh, we really value your feedback. Before Annette starts a presentation, and just to give the last few people a few more minutes to, uh, to join us, I'd like to share my story about Kerry, who's an owner of our Christmas holiday Big Four campsite. I've got to know Kerry really well over the last 20 years. And five years ago, Kerry, then aged 52, who was really fit and active at the time, went to see a GP for a pretty routine medical issue. Uh, just by chance, Kerry was seen by a locum as her GP was on leave. And the locum said to her when she walked in the door, how long have you had your kidney disease for, Kerry? Kerry looked at him shocked and said, what do you mean? I don't have kidney disease. The locum had looked up her notes and some past pathology to get a bit of background before Kerry walked in the door. Blood tests completed three months earlier, for which a recall had somehow fallen through the cracks, indicated that Kerry had serious kidney failure. To cut a long story short, Kerry's life suddenly changed dramatically as the CKD progressed really quickly and she commenced dialysis within a few months and 18 months later received a kidney transplant. You'll hear tonight about how CKD can be a silently lurking how CKD can be silently lurking in the background and what role you can play to get better outcomes for your patients. So on that note, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker for tonight's webinar, Annette Bizant. Annette is an experienced nurse practitioner at Monash Health Nephrology. She works with a multidisciplinary team to ensure that patients at all stages of chronic kidney disease receive timely and effective care. And it has a special interest in slowing the progression of CKD and improving the patient care journey, particularly for those with complex needs. Thanks, Annette. Thanks so much, Steph. And thanks, everyone from Eastern uh, Primary Health Network for having me along tonight. And thanks so much, Steph, for sharing your story. Just uh, unfortunately, um, Kerry's story is still all too common and um, patients that I see every week are still unfortunately presenting very late um, and in the advanced stage of their illness. And that has that knock-on effect of poor outcomes throughout their whole illness journey. So hopefully um, some take-home messages from tonight is gonna help to prevent that for even one person. And, and that's gonna be a great thing. Thanks to the PEAK committee who have developed and reviewed this education model. There's been a few updates since um, I last presented it, which was quite some time ago. And um, as I'll show you later on, there's a few more um, changes that have come out even in the interim to me receiving this and presenting tonight. So the aim of tonight's presentation will be about um, giving you the skills to apply the kidney health check to be able to detect kidney disease early in the primary care setting and um, to implement the optimal management strategies to slow or halt progression. 
So the outcomes will be to explain how chronic kidney disease, diabetes and cardiovascular disease interact and influence each other, outline the health burdens of these conditions and the impact on a person's well-being, and review medications and treatment when managing CKD alongside diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I apologise if I, I don't answer any questions along the way. I'm not sure if I'll be able to see any that come up on the screen with um, my display, but I will get back to them at the end. So first of all, understanding what is CKD. CKD is defined as an estimated glomerular filtration rate of less than 60 mils per minute um, that is present for greater than three months with or without evidence of kidney damage or when there is evidence of kidney damage with or without a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate that is present for more than three months. And the evidence of kidney damage may be seen by albuminuria or protein in the urine, hematuria after the exclusion of urological causes or structural abnormalities, which will be seen on the various imaging tests available and or pathological abnormalities. The key to a definition of chronic kidney disease is that it must be present for greater than three months. CKD is a major problem. One in 10 Australian adults has CKD and less than 10% of people with CKD are aware that they have the condition. The reason for this is that up to 90% of kidney function can be lost without the person experiencing any symptoms. So hence, they're not going to their GP, um, presenting with their practice with any kind of um, issues of concern. And it is those routine tests where we are often picking it up for people. And that's why those um, useful tools that you guys have in your practices are vital. It's a major and independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it is common, it is harmful, but it is treatable. And early detection and um, screening is really what the tools are for us to help manage a condition properly. We can reduce morbidity and mortality. We can slow progression or halt progression in some cases. We can prevent complications and we can reduce cardiovascular risk. And the way this is done is by using the uh, EGFR to um, use the staging map that is in the management booklet and um, though implementing the strategies that you will learn about, and this can slow progression by up to 50%. So uh, Steph mentioned that you would have all received the uh, case that uh, overnight or during the day, and hopefully you've had a chance to fill it in. If not, then grab a pen and perhaps you might wanna have a go at answering some of these questions as we go along now. So the first question being combined, what percentage of Australian adults are affected by one or more of these conditions being chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or cardiovascular disease? And I'll just give you a moment to have a think. I'd like to be able to have someone give me an answer, but I'm, I don't have that capacity to do that. So moving on to our next slide, 29% of Australian adults are affected by one or more of chronic kidney disease, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So quite a significant proportion of our population. It's important to recognise when a person does have one of these conditions because the tools and resources that you have in your practice can often be interlinked and utilised and perhaps just adding in one extra tool that you may not have through perhaps your diabetes annual cycle of care or your cardiovascular guidelines might be the key between detection or a misdiagnosis. So um, sharing those treatment goals and management strategies are a really effective means. And remembering that each affects the morbidity, mortality and outcome of the other. 5.6 million Australians have at least one of these three conditions. That's quite a significant proportion of our population. It's actually quite a scary number when you break it down and think about that. 
the biggest being cardiovascular disease, but not followed too far behind by our CKD population. And I'll talk a little bit more about the impact that that has on our healthcare system. This is quite an old slide. It's been around in nephrology circles for many years now. And what it's showing you is the um, underlying cause of kidney disease at the time of a person's entry onto a kidney replacement therapy program. So that is dialysis or uh, kidney transplant. In 2003, diabetes became the leading cause of kidney end-stage kidney disease in Australia, and in fact, worldwide, and it's remained that way and is separating away from the other causes of kidney disease as we progress um, further along. The um, stats in Australia as of 2021 were that 38% of all people commencing dialysis or um, receiving a transplant at the end stage, 38% uh, had diabetic nephropathy as their underlying primary renal disease. And that number in New Zealand and some of our other Pacific Island nations is even higher. In New Zealand, it's actually up to 46% of the end-stage kidney disease population. So um, quite a scary statistic, particularly considering that uh, diabetes is and uh, kidney disease in itself are largely um, treatable and largely preventable. This is the uh, impact of hospitalisation of having one of these three multimorbidities. 23% of all non-dialysis admissions to hospital in the last few years have been related to chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease or diabetes. So that is excluding dialysis but dialysis is the leading cause of same-day admissions in Australia. One third of all hospital admissions in Australia per year are due to one of these three conditions or a combination of these conditions. And chronic kidney disease actually contributes to 11% of all deaths in Australia. With that becomes an added cost to the system. It's quite an old slide and I don't have the current cost to be able to talk to you about them. But on the left, you can see that a person with no diabetes, no chronic kidney disease, the estimated annual direct healthcare cost per person is around about 1,500 or just under $1,600. Over to the right, where we have stages three, four and five kidney disease, either with or without diabetes, the costs are and just under $6,000 or $7,000 respectively. And what's not shown on this slide is the costs of maintaining a person on dialysis therapy. The average cost for somebody receiving a centre-based being the predominant mode of um, dialysis therapy or hemodialysis, the average cost for maintaining one person is $80,000 to $100,000 per year. And currently we have around 15,000 people in Australia receiving kidney replacement therapy. So onto our case study. Dennis is somebody that you and I would be seeing in our practice every single day. Dennis is 54 years old. He works full time in a landscaping supplies company. His work has been impacted statewide by the lockdowns. And today he turns up for his usual blood pressure and, um, medication. He just wants his scripts filled as many people do. His history includes a high blood pressure history of 18 years, dyslipidemia diagnosed six months ago, a three year history of diabetes, which he's been diet controlled. His medical, his other, he's also got a diagnosis of CKD stage 3B with microalbuminuria. If you look uh, in the staging grid that is in the uh, management practice, you will see the different levels of um, staging to help you with a, a diagnosis of stage one through to five with or without albuminuria um, and with the underlying uh, disease causing, which is how we, we classify kidney disease. Dennis also has um, knee osteoarthritis. 
He is a past smoker, current, currently consumes alcohol three to five per drinks, three to five drinks per week, sorry. And his medic only medication is an ifedipine slow release, 60 milligrams daily with no side effects. Like many people in his age bracket, he hasn't shown an interest in his uh, disease prevention measures, but his cousins recently had an angioplasty for a myocardial infarction. And this has given Dennis a bit of a scare. And he's a bit worried mainly that he's not gonna be able to afford how to financially manage being off work with some kind of major um, event. Dennis's cousin is actually somebody that I get called in to see often and, and I'll talk a little bit about those kind of people if we have time at the end. So Dennis has had some blood tests done and a, a urine test done. His blood glucose is nine millimoles and an A1C of 8%, potassium 4.2, creatinine 165. This gives him an EGFR of 40 mils per minute. His cholesterol levels are also documented there and his ACR is elevated at 22.6 milligrams per millimole. You've examined his blood pressure in preparing him for his repeat prescription and found that his blood pressure today was 150 on 90 and it had been recorded previously at 145 on 95. His weight 92 kilograms and his BMI is elevated at 30. So back to your questions, which of the following are effective risk reduction strategies in the management of CKD. And I'll just give people who may not have had a chance to answer a, a, a few seconds. So the effective risk reduction strategies in the management of kidney disease are actually all of these. Blood pressure lowering, lipid lowering with statins, diabetes management and lifestyle changes. And we're going to talk about each of these uh, various strategies um, throughout the coming slides. So CKD, diabetes and cardiovascular disease are all linked with interrelated biological pathways and risk factors. These include physical inactivity, poor nutrition, overweight and obesity, high blood pressure, smoking, harmful use of alcohol, high blood cholesterol levels and insulin resistance. And this helps to guide us with managing those risk reduction strategies. On the left of this slide, you can see what the risk factors for chronic kidney disease are, being high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, the overweight obesity, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background, um, and age over 60. Um, I just do need to mention that age in itself is not a risk factor. It is in combination with one of the other risk factors. The top three on the right, cardiovascular disease for the person or the family history, or the family history of kidney disease or acute kidney injury are also the remaining factors that um, put a person most at risk of chronic kidney disease. But you can see um, by the ticks that are, are there that there is a lot of overlap between um, all of the three conditions. So we've established that Dennis is at risk of cardiovascular disease because of his underlying um, kidney disease. How are we going to assess what his risk is? Would you use the absolute cardiovascular risk calculator? Would you assume that because he has stage three CKD, he is already at high risk? Or would you assume that his high blood pressure is the best indicator of a future cardiovascular event? What we do know is that because Dennis has stage three CKD, he is already at the highest risk. People who are already at the highest risk of a cardiovascular event fall across all of the categories um, or all of these three diseases. But the ones that are most important to remember in my context, people with chronic kidney disease 
are those who have an EGFR of less than 45 mils a minute, or those who have persistent proteinuria, or those who have diabetes and microalbuminuria. Any of the people that are listed within this category or any of the people in your practice that you identify within any of these categories that are on the screen should not be having their cardiovascular risk assessed using the risk tool because they are already at the highest risk and should be managed accordingly. So we do know that cardio, uh, chronic kidney disease is a very potent risk factor for CKD. And so you do need to know what your person's CKD status is before you go and use this uh, CVD risk tool. And people with chronic kidney disease have a two to three greater risk of death than people who don't have chronic kidney disease. And in the area where I work, which is predominantly the dialysis setting, we often call the dialysis patients or the people with end-stage kidney disease the survivors because people with chronic kidney disease are actually 20 times more likely to die from a cardiovascular um, event than to survive the need for dialysis or a kidney transplant. So that statistic in itself is um, quite scary. So back to Dennis, he has high blood pressure. What target would we be aiming for Dennis? 120 on 80, 130 on 80, 140 on 90, or 110 on 60? The blood pressure target for somebody with CKD is 130 on 80 consistently. So we do like to maintain a consistent blood pressure target for obvious reasons, but we do also need to remember that treatment targets should always be individualized. For some people, it's appropriate to aim for a lower target, but there are also some people where we may need to target a slightly uh, higher range, um, balancing the risk versus the benefit and um, the individual patient circumstances. So just as a brief example, we may have a frail elderly with advanced diabetic autonomic neuropathy um, who cannot stand up without having a significant postural drop in their blood pressure. And we may need to consider a slightly more relaxed target for that person. But certainly for the vast majority, and in particular people like Dennis, we're aiming for a, a target that is consistently below 130 on 80. The problem with blood pressure management in somebody with chronic kidney disease is it can be a real challenge to treat. High blood pressure damages the small blood vessels that surround the filtering system of the kidney, and that creates damage. The damaged filters can no longer filter the fluids effectively from the body. They, uh, so the fluid accumulates in the blood vessels and the filter, and we end up with a compounding problem where damaged kidneys are causing high blood pressure, and high blood pressure in itself is damaging the kidneys so it's one of the particular challenges where we often see patients being referred through to us because um, in, ge in general practice, uh, blood, blood pressure control has not been able to achieve uh, to the target. We talked about the various uh, risk reduction strategies for a person with um, chronic kidney disease. And the number one approach that we should all be considering as nurses is the lifestyle approaches non-pharmaceutical measures to uh, improve blood pressure. So this is the SNAP approach, smoking, nutrition, alcohol, and physical activity. So working with our patients on the strategies to stop smoking, to implement a low salt diet, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Working with uh, allied health teams to uh, reduce BMI, encouraging a reduction in alcohol intake. And again, working with allied health teams such as exercise physiologists uh, via the chronic disease management plans that you have access to, 
uh, to work on exercise programs or um, using other services in the community. I just wanted to come back to mention a low salt diet. One of the things that you might like to jot down is um, I do a lot of education in regards to diet across uh, all sorts of dietary aspects of kidney disease. And one of the best resources that is out there, not only for people with diabetes, but for, uh, sorry, for kidney disease, but for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and in fact, any disease condition, is the NEMO website. So it's the Nutrition Education Modules Online. It's based from Queensland. Um, and it has a huge amount of professional and uh, patient materials. Uh, just search whatever you might be looking for. So for example, type in salt into the search engine and it will come up with a, a range of resources that might be appropriate for your patient. Uh, visual resources, written resources, um, professional resources, teaching people how to re read um, labels. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of using that uh, site along as with the Australian Diet Healthy Eating Guidelines and Kidney Health Australia resources. So never underestimate the benefits that the lifestyle modifications can have on reducing a person's blood pressure. Working with someone to achieve a five kilogram weight loss can see a four millimeter of mercury reduction. Working with someone on that diet soda, sodium restriction can have a four to seven millimeter reduction in um, blood pressure. Diet, dietary sodium, uh, coming back to the salt thing, um, the amount of people I've had say to me, oh, but I don't add salt to my diet. And then we have to go back to, well, Salt in everything that we eat, you know, we're, we have a very highly processed Western diet, even cornflakes have high salt. Um, so the resources that are out there are wonderful for us to use. The DASH diet, uh, the way I promote the DASH diet is by simply telling my patients that a fresh is best approach um, is the easiest way for them to remember and can have up to a 10 millimeter of or 10 plus millimeter of mercury reduction. Physical activity, 30 to 60 minutes on most days of the week. Again, we can see a fairly healthy reduction in blood pressure. And encouraging our patients to have no more than two drinks per day for men or one drink per day for women. And we can see a 67% reduction from baseline of three to six drinks per day. For Dennis, looking at this uh, graph, if we consistently maintained his blood pressure below target, he would have a 62%, um, he, he would have a 62% reduction in his um, or loss of chance of, sorry. <laughs> the, his GFR loss would be 62% reduced. So if I look at it another way, if his blood pressure is well controlled, he's only gonna have a two mil per year reduction in his GFR. So a slow or, st or a stabilization of his GFR, remembering that over the age of 40, we do all lose a little bit of our kidney function each year. So it is gonna decline, albeit slowly, even with the blood pressure control. If his blood pressure stays where it is now or worsens, Dennis is gonna be at end stage kidney disease within three years, three to four years. And that's a pretty scary thought for him. So the mainstay of blood pressure management for a person with chronic kidney disease for some time now has been the use of ACE or ARB. I'm sure that that's fairly well understood now out in general practice land. It's um, used widely, of course, in our type two or in all of our diabetic population. And we know that the use of ARB significantly reduces, or ACE, significantly reduces the risk of a cardiovascular event. And it also reduces the progression of kidney disease through various mechanisms, inc including the uh, reduction of protein loss or albumin loss through the urine. So Dennis's blood pressure being above target has been a cause for review today, and he's been prescribed an ACE inhibitor. He's also been started on metformin for his diabetes, 
but I will put the caveat in that whilst it does say here he can be titrated up to a gram BD in, in our practice, we would be dose reducing because he's got a GFR of less than 60 mils a minute. So he'd probably only be on about one gram if he were coming to my practice. And he's had an appointment made for the primary nurse to come and see him to discuss any um, further dietary changes and exercise plans and a follow-up appointment for two months time. He's come back. This time around, his blood glucose level has uh, settled down to seven, but his creatinine has climbed to 183 and his GFR has dropped to 35 mils per minute. We haven't rechecked the other parameters at this particular time. So because Dennis's GFR has reduced since the last visit, do you feel that this needs to be addressed? And if so, in what way? Would you refer him through to a nephrologist? Would you think that he doesn't need to be referred just yet because ACE inhibitors and ARBs can cause a reversible decline in his GFR? And because it's been less than a 25% reduction and stable, he can continue on this medication. Or no, his GFR is not of concern until he's, um, it drops below 30 mils per minute. You've all had a chance to answer that. So Dennis doesn't need to be referred at the moment. And in fact, because the ACE has um, caused a reversible decline of less than 25% and stable, we're happy that he can be continued to be monitored at this time. So as I just mentioned a few moments ago, ACEs and ARBs are very useful in reducing the loss of albumin through the urine. But the way that they do this is by altering the dynamics within the kidney. So they cause a relaxation of the vessels, which um, has the knock-on effect of uh, looking at, like it's a demonstrable uh, loss of GFR. But providing that that GFR is less than 25% within the two months, it is safe for the person to continue on that. Um, if the person were to continue, to continue to cease their medication, we would expect to see that that GFR returns to the baseline range. But we do recommend that if there is a greater than 25% reduction from baseline, then the person should cease that medication and you should seek further advice. Cautions should always be taken if the person does have a baseline potassium of higher than 5.5 because the uh, mechanism of action of an ACE or an ARB will see an elevation of the serum potassium. Uh, but dietary interventions, particularly when the potassium is um, above five, um, can often help mitigate any of those uh, rises that we may see. And we never use ACE or ARB um, unless on specialist advice. And I've never seen um, in the 20 years that I've been uh, in this field, I have not seen anybody on a combined use of an ACE or an ARB. So Dennis has remained on his ACE inhibitor, uh, but he's had some further repeat blood tests and his A1C has improved with the use of his um, metformin, which is great to see. His GFR is continuing to remain stable within his baseline range and his cholesterol levels are elevated across the whole spectrum. So Dennis has been working with the uh, dietitian and with the, you as the practice nurse in his specialty. But despite that, we can't see that his lipids are at target. So do you think that he would benefit from pharmacotherapy for his dyslipidemia? Would you say yes, there is strong evidence that lipid lowering in people with chronic kidney disease will decrease the risk of atherosclerotic events? Or no, there is no evidence that lipid lowering for people with CKD will decrease the risk of atherosclerotic events?
Our recommendation is absolutely yes, there is strong evidence that lipid lowering in people with chronic kidney disease will decrease the risk of atherosclerotic events. And what this slide is showing you that for all people with CKD, not on dialysis, and the reason that we say not on dialysis is that unfortunately in almost all cases, people on dialysis are always excluded from studies. That being said, we extrapolate most of the data from um, people in the general CKD population for use with two people on dialysis in the absence of having uh, RCTs for these people. So um, across all of these studies, all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, major cardiovascular events and fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction, people with CKD fared better by being on a statin than those who were not. And the CARI guidelines for anybody who might be interested in looking into the guidelines that we use to base our care around, the Caring for Australasian uh, for, with Renal Impairment, great resource, um, multitude of uh, documents there if you ever want to go and look it up. But this gives you strong recommendations that people with CKD who have an EGFR of greater than 15 mils a min and an absolute cardiovascular disease risk of greater than 10% should receive statin therapy, plus or minus azetamide. And that Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island people and Maori with chronic kidney disease greater than 15 mils a minute and an absolute cardiovascular disease risk of greater than 5% should receive statins, plus or minus azetamide. So it's really good practice point that the patients that you're seeing in your practice who do have CKD, of any stage and have albuminuria and pr um, primary hypercholesterolemia should receive a statin. And make sure that you're talking to their patients, that you, to your patients that, you know, we do recommend it. It is generally well tolerated and it is um, an important pharmacotherapy to help prevent cardiovascular events and death. So Dennis is with you. You've reinforced to him that his dietary efforts are really important and have been really beneficial, but that a cholesterol lowering treatment is well tolerated and also recommended for him at this point in time. And that you do recommend that he starts the um, desired medication that has been chosen for him to start. After discussion with Dennis, the GP has also decided that it might be beneficial for um, Dennis to begin an additional hypoglycemic agent. So which agent would you be choosing for him? Or would your practice be choosing for him? A sulfonylurea, an SGLT2, a DPP4, or a GLP1 receptor agonist? So the new kid, well, the relative new kid on the block and the wonderful tool that we now have in the world of kidney land um, after many years of really only having an ace up our sleeve is the SGLT2 and is certainly something that we would be recommending for Dennis in this instance. This a slide is um, from another great resource that we use in um, nephrology, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. So a worldwide uh, database for guideline recommendation. And this is the algorithm that we now use for diabetes management for people with CKD. So those resources that we've talked about uh, or those strategies that we've talked about, physical activity, working on nutrition, working on weight loss, uh, so the lifestyle measures and first line therapy for glycemic control for a person with chronic kidney disease continues to be metformin with a dose reduction uh, if the GFR is less than 45, um, usually stopping, in most instances always stopping if it is less than 30 um, or if the person is on dialysis. Our second line or our first line treatment in conjunction with metformin now 
but for organ protection being renal protection and uh, cardio protection is the SGLT2 inhibitor. On this slide, it does say that we would not initiate that if the GFR was less than 30 mils a minute, but that has changed the recent indications and we would not initiate that now um, if the GFR was less than 25 mils a minute and we will be discontinuing once the person moves on to dialysis as we don't have a, any data about the benefits when a person is on dialysis. And the additional drug therapy needed for glycemic control is then the selection of all of the other agents that we do have available to us in the diabetes world. So I'll just chat briefly about the commonly used diabetes medications and the implications that it, you might need to consider for a patient in your practice who has diabetes and who has CKD. If your patient is on metformin, you would be making sure that the dose is reduced when the GFR is reduced or ceased if the GFR is under 30 and the patient should be educated with their sick day management plan to uh, temporarily stop if they are unwell, particularly with a febrile or dehydrating type of illness or if they are presenting for surgery. The SGLT2 inhibitors, as you could see from the previous slide, in particularly in the lower levels of kidney disease, we are not seeing the benefits on glycemia uh, with the SGLT2 inhibitor, but we are absolutely seeing the benefits of cardio and renal protection. We are implementing the agent from a GFR as low as 25, and we will be continuing the foot for one of the agents or as low as 45 for the other agent. And we would be discontinuing the agent when the patient starts dialysis. Education is paramount when starting or um, working with a patient who is on one of these, um, particularly in regards to the genitourinary infection risk uh, and in regards to the risk of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So similar to metformin, you would always be advising your patient to temporarily cease the medication if they are experiencing any dehydrating type illness or any febrile type illness and not recommencing that until they are being reviewed uh, and to maintain good genitourinary hygiene. In terms of the glyptins, these are safe to use in CKD. Uh, and in particular, one uh, agent doesn't need any dose adjustment, even for people who are on dialysis. Sulfonylureas, uh, we don't, we, we're, some of the agents we won't use in the more advanced stages of kidney disease, it's renally excreted and hypoglycemic risk becomes quite a problem. Uh, but we do safely use other agents through two people who are on dialysis. That being said, most people who are on dialysis have had diabetes for a very long period of time um, and often their pancreas is worn out. So the uh, medication itself loses its efficacy and we're looking to the other agents to use. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, some of them are contraindicated in the lower GFRs. Uh, it does say here that others are not recommended with a um, GFR of less than 15. We are learning more about cardiovascular benefits of these agents and possibly some renal protection. And we are starting to use um, one of the agents in lower GFRs and a very small handful of patients we are actually using on to dialysis now. And the reason for that is because uh, the weight loss benefits that the people have experienced on these, as you would be familiar in your practice, they're very reluctant to stop the medication. Um, and we are finding that uh, we are developing some safety data around using in those levels, lower levels of GFR. And in particular for people on dialysis who want to have a transplant, weight gain is something that they really want to avoid because weight gain is um, a, a barrier towards transplantation. So hence we are starting very early days, but starting to use the agents in that space. And insulin we'll use at normal doses, um, titrated according to blood sugar level. But as with the sulfonylureas, the risk of hypoglycemia increases as the GFR decreases, 
one because of the uremia and loss of appetite that comes because of CKD, but also because of the, um, re the renal excretion of uh, insulin and it hanging around in the body for longer. So this is a very busy slide, but it is a um, synopsis of a systematic review and meta-analysis, 27 studies, uh, just over 7,000 participants, all with an EGFR of less than 60 mils a minute. What these studies all showed us that um, without a doubt, the SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of cardiorenal outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD without there being clear evidence of additional safety concerns beyond those that are already known for the class. So this is now our um, weapon against the fight of kidney disease. Uh, or against kidney disease that we are now using in combination with our ACE. And having not had anything on the horizon for a long time, it is quite an exciting space to be working in and seeing the real benefits that these agents are having for the patients. The DAPA CKD study was probably the game changer for really identifying that we were slowing, able to slow the risk of uh, decline in kidney disease. And it really has been only in the last, I can't remember how many weeks or months, uh, but we now have access to be able to prescribe um, this agent to patients with CKD who don't have uh, a comorbid um, diagnosis of uh, diabetes. So um, it's great that it has really broadened up the availability to a larger patient population. Um, and I'm sure with its indications now for heart failure and for CKD and for diabetes, we're gonna see a lot more uh, in this space in the coming months and years. So after starting the SGLT2 inhibitor, Dennis's GFR drops to 32 mils per minute. Should we be stopping the medication for him? Yes, no, or maybe? No, we actually don't need to stop the medication for Dennis in, his, in this instance. So what this slide is telling you from the EMPA-REG trial is that we, similar to the ACE or the ARB, we can see an EGFR drop in the first few weeks of therapy. So within the first four weeks of therapy, but that drop of GFR um, stabilizes and is just sustained way out beyond the six month period. So we're seeing a, a acceptable decline in the same manner that we might see with an ACE inhibitor. It's a predictable and reversible reduction in the GFR. We will tolerate up to a 30% decrease. The reason for that is because we're blocking the uh, SGLT2 co-transporter, which is responsible for reabsorbing the glucose and the sodium in the proximal tubule of the kidney, because the sodium and the glucose is now moving out through the urine. It's reducing the pressure within the kidney and that's being reflected in what we see as a reduced EF, uh, EGFR. But sometimes we do see a reduction of greater than 30% and we have to uh, stop the medication, assess the patient for other causes of um, AKI, and sometimes the patient is not able to tolerate returning onto that medication. And one of the other parts of the education that we do talk to them when we start them on this is about maintaining well, uh, good hydration because it causes urination. So as part of the whole of person management um, of CKD, you do decide that it's really important to visit Dennis's mental health. So which of the following are common in CKD? And I will have to move along a bit. I'm just mindful of the time. I'm sorry, I tend to talk a little bit much. Uh, depression, cognitive decline and poor quality of life. All of these are really important factors to revisit for Dennis who had already acknowledged back at the beginning that he was feeling a bit stressed and he'd been struggling with some lockdowns. 
So you use the depression and anxiety uh, stress scale to see how Dennis is going and you can clearly see that he has uh, felt some impact over the last 12 months uh, across all three of those measures. Unfortunately, there can be a ripple effect and left unchecked, it can have all sorts of implications for dentists. The biochemical changes such as high blood glucose, uremia, endothelial dysfunction, vascular injury, can then impact and have an effect on cognitive decline. It can make him feel less active. It can uh, bring on those feelings of depression and it can exacerbate pain and fatigue. And the knock-on effect in terms of his quality of life and the social and economic uh, impacts are huge. The loss of in, um, employment, the financial insecurity, the increased healthcare costs, which was one of the things that he said he was concerned about at the beginning, the reduced capacity to be able to self-care, the increased need for family supports, um, and the impact that that has on relationships, both family and friendships are huge. And, and we see this time and time again, day after day um, in my line of work. Using the CKD management booklet, you've identified that Dennis has got CKD stage 3B, and that gives you an orange clinical action plan to be able to work with him. It gives you a step-by-step -step layout of all the management strategies to be able to implement and um, put as an adjunct to what you may already have in place for him in terms of his diabetes care. So you're gonna review him every three to six months, which will include blood pressure, weight, and smoking assessments, and the lab assessments, really important, make sure you're getting that urine assessment in conjunction with the blood tests, such as the EGFR, the electrolytes, the A1C, the lipids, the full blood count, calcium and phosphate, and PTH, also really important for someone with kidney disease. I can't stress enough the importance of collecting the ACR, and I think this is where we're missing a lot of the kidney disease in general practice. I don't have this slide on this presentation, but we know that a person can lose up to 50% of their kidney function before we see an elevation in the creatinine. And the way that we're commonly picking that up is through detecting that loss of albumin or in the ACR. So a really, really important tool to be doing your blood pressure, your urine test and your blood test in conjunction together. So who needs to see a nephrologist? Anybody who has an EGFR of under 30 mils a minute, anybody who has persistent significant albuminuria, anybody who has a sustained degree, a decrease in their GFR of 25% or more within 12 months, or you're seeing a consistent loss of a GFR lowering 15 mils per minute or more per year or anybody who's really hard to get their blood pressure at target despite being on at least three agents. People with a stable GFR, uh, uh, ACR of less than 30 or well-controlled blood pressure, referral's not necessary, but it is an individualized decision. So you may have a young person who needs to be seen sooner. You may have somebody who has um, a non-identifiable or readily identifiable underlying cause. So definitely always refer earlier if you have any concerns at all. It does take a whole of practice approach to be able to manage a person with CKD. So really include everybody you can, the GP, the practice nurse, utilize those GP chronic disease management plan, make sure you know what those item numbers that you can use, link into the dietitians, link into your psychologist, link into your exercise physiologist and so make sure that your data systems can work for you. We, I, we did have a really great recall system that we worked many years ago in the Medicare local day and it was a, a wonderful program that we had running. The copy um, of the, the e-copy of the management in primary care booklet can be downloaded free via the Kidney Health Australia website or if you do prefer a hard copy it is available. Um, via the website also you can order and there is a CKD Go app if you want to be uh, using some patient resources that you can show your patient uh, where their kidney disease is at and help with your education. So in terms of addressing CKD in your practice, once again, just to reiterate, use the integrated care and management plans available to you. 
use the a handbook to guide your care. It's a very step-by-step -step and e easy to use approach um, with the heat map to risk stratify. Use the data, practice data that you have to identify your patients. Uh, stage the patients using that heat map that I just mentioned and pop it into your software and use those recall systems to actively call back and screen patients because symptoms will not be your trigger. And support and assist patients to manage their CKD. There's lots of resources out there via the Kidney Health Australia website, using the NEMO resource tools, using the Australian Healthy Eating Guidelines, contacting us in the tertiary healthcare services whenever you have questions, we're more than happy to help. Lots of patient resources are available via the Kidney Health Australia website. So take a look sometime and um, make it your friend. And just to finish up, take home messages, lifestyle management can't underestimate the importance of the nurse initiated lifestyle management strategies that can be done. Never underestimate or forget about the need for psychosocial support. Use the coding of the CKD in the medical software. Make sure that you are monitoring and maintaining blood pressures at target. Strive for excellent glycemic control. Absolutely consider SGLT2s as part of your management strategy. And RAS blockade, of course, is first line management. And use the medication reviews on a regular basis because they do need dose adjustments according to what the patient's GFR is. And use your GP management plans as best as possible to access everything out there that's available. I probably haven't got time to read through the messages from this report, um, but we know that CKD rarely occurs in isolation and frequently occurs alongside diabetes and cardiovascular disease. 30% of Australian adults are affected by one or more. Unfortunately, our most disadvantaged are experiencing the disproportionate burden of the disease. It contributes to a huge proportion of hospitalisation and psychosocial factors play a huge role in patient outcomes with depression being highly prevalent in the patient population that we've talked about tonight. So thank you everyone for listening to me and I will um, stop sharing this screen so I can perhaps see you and happy to take any questions. So the one question that I've answered is uh, someone wanted to know the Nemo um, name again. So I've put a link into that. Um, is there any other questions that you'd like to type into the question and answer box? Um, perhaps uh, because we're running just nearly on time, I'll do a the start of a closing and then let you know if there's anything that's been typed in um, as we um, close the session, Annette. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, so thanks for sharing your amazing knowledge and experience in, in this webinar. Um, it's certainly provided much food for thought on the things to consider and the opportunities to limit CKD in, in patients. And with 5.6 million people you mentioned in Australia with CKD, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and or cardiovascular disease, um, you can be certain out there that some of them will be sitting in your waiting rooms with under, undiagnosed CKD. Um, just checking, yeah. Um, thanks everyone for attending tonight. Um, we really appreciate it and we'd even more appreciate it if you could answer the short evaluation survey um, which, did you want to put your next slide up, Anish, that has the QR code? Um, is that available? Or no, that, that's um, probably... Okay. I don't. Uh, Sorry, yes, I do. Yeah, so you can either click on that QR code with your phones or when you uh, hang up from this session, the uh, evaluation will pop up automatically. Now, you only need to uh, do one. Um, so one or the other would be really greatly appreciated and your feedback will also be shared with Kidney Health Australia. Um, so as we mentioned at the outset, the webinar has been recorded. Uh, so it will be, we'll publicise in our comms when it's available on the Kidney Health Australia webinar platform. There are many webinars there that are excellent um, on a range of topics. And um, just checking the, there are no other questions. 
So we might on that note, 7.31, we've done well. Um, <laughs> we look forward to seeing you at our other events in the future and um, have a good night. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>